Okay, so um, I already heard people say, who are those people up there? Are they with the conservation district? Um, <laughs> sort of, kind of, but not really. Um, we actually are our own group, the Islands Climate Resilience. And um, who we are is just a group of people, including Linda at the conservation district and Carrie who works at the conservation district. Uh, it's a group of folks from the island here who uh, got together to work on climate-related issues. And um, give some background on us. We were formed a year ago, uh, in November of 2014, following the <laughs> which is actually remarkable for any group. Um, so there was that great lecture series. Most of the lectures were held here um, that went on for the, the summer of 2014, science-based lectures talking about the impacts of climate change. And then um, what our goal is here is to facilitate the development of a Salmon Islands Climate Resilient Community Action Plan. Uh, consisting of existing and needed community policies and actions to address climate-related impacts and incorporating an adaptive process for annual implementation, evaluation, and adjustment of plan and policies and action. <laughs> That's a lot of meetings to come up with that mouthful. Uh, so what we've been up to, we've been having regular meetings. Uh, most months, more than once a month over the last year. Uh, we've been trying to coordinate our efforts um, with other islands. We've been actively searching for funding for this enterprise. Uh, we had outreach uh, uh, table at the Energy Fair. We did the Years of Living Dangerously film series, um, along with folks on both Orcas and Lopez Island. And then a series of lectures, which we have, were kind of related to. Uh, Dr. Charles Green from Cornell the, uh, did the Fossil Fuel Junkies Bioenergy and Algae. Uh, Nick Bond, who is a little bit more associated with the Madrona Institute and the, um, uh, actually both of these last ones were the Madrona Institute and uh, the Conservation District. And then upcoming here, uh, another thing we're working on, a climate book group. Uh, what we think about when we try not to think about global warming. Yeah, so this is a, a great book that um, Nikita um, over in Lopez has led a book group. They read it together and they did a discussion. And we're going to do it over here again uh, beginning this week. So this Thursday at the Grange is going to be our first one. You don't have to have read the book. Um, you don't even have to have the book yet. We're going to have a few copies available for purchase there. You can get it online. You can have it on your mobile traveling device. But we're going to read and discuss together uh, twice a month until the end of January. So if you want to join us uh, this Thursday at the Grange um, at 6 o'clock. Okay. And then this kind of is rewinding back. Um, how many of you uh, attended the, the um, community discussion we had on climate change impacts over at the Grange? That was in July, July yeah. 20th. So a lot of us were there. Yeah, so this was a, a big thing where we kind of divided things up into uh, specific sectors, kind of arbitrary. And um, the, one of those that came out as really the one that seemed to generate the most interest, the most passion out of the community, the one that had the most participants, uh, was freshwater resources. And so we're not alone. This is a recent study coming from the Pew uh, Research Center, looking at uh, asking this question kind of worldwide of uh, people, you know, what are you concerned about? And uh, droughts or water shortages actually ranks as the number one thing that people are nervous about worldwide related to climate impacts. So, so uh, Carrie and I just attended the um, Pacific Northwest Climate uh, Conference, and I uh, just want to share a couple of poignant relative things to this uh, discussion. The first was that um, there's a lot of questions about this year. So I probably have heard in the media saying, is this what you know the future's going to look like? Um, and there was a resounding, maybe, um, <laughs> from that conference that um, some of these things maybe, you know, they're, they're definitely temperature-wise in the Pacific Northwest for the water year 2015, we are at about uh, plus 4.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that's not too far off of what, um, you know, maybe 50 years out is, is a, an assumption. Um, there's a lot of variability uh, to that. Um, another thing that was described um, was that um, a really hard thing for people to wrap their, their minds around is that we're in a wet drought. How can you have a wet drought? Well, your average precipitation uh, happens that may be at the wrong time of year um, or in the wrong form. Uh, in the mountains, they get a lot of rain events rather than snow. And you might remember down here, uh, we had uh, quite a lot of big storm events, um, but a lot of this, uh, particularly going back to about April, um, March, April last year, just not much rain at all here until that fantastic flood in uh, September. So. so what they encouraged us to do was to stop thinking about percentage uh, in terms of normal. 
Um, that's the wrong frame of mind because we had, you know, region-wide, maybe not out here in the islands, average precipitation this last year. It's more a question of how much do you need, for what purpose, and when do you need it? So, yeah. we had a lot on that day in Friday Arbor, um, but that wasn't when we needed it or how we needed it, right? Okay, so um, tonight's set up so that we're going to have brief presentations from a bunch of local experts in different um, water fields. Um, so one of the things when we were trying to put together what came out of that water sector group in July 20th, we looked at all the different topics and it was by far the most attended and had the most questions and the most uncertainty and the most urgency. And of course, it was right in the middle of July, so it was very dry. Um, but we had all these good questions and we thought, well, wait, we have, in the San Juan County, we have a water resource management committee. We got a lot of water issues in the county. We should go, we should figure out what they do and what they know, because they probably can answer a lot of these questions. So we went to a couple meetings um, and started having a discussion and put together an agenda based on some of the expertise that that committee has, and then also looked at some of the other additional questions. And this is the agenda that we've come up with for tonight, where our idea is to have the speakers have a few minutes to give just an overall on some of the questions we've asked them, and then to sit back down and have the next speaker answer some of those questions that have been asked. And then we're going to spend the next 45 minutes to an hour as a group being able to ask them questions and having them answer back and forth and having more of a community dialogue. So it's really the format of us learning something from the questions we wanted to know, have some expertise to fill in some of those gaps, and then have a, a discussion together. So the way we've got to have it lined up, actually, is what do we know currently about water resources and what does this water management committee do? And we thought we would have Vicki Heater, who is the former um, chair of that, give us kind of that overview. Um, we also want to know, what is our current water use on the islands? Um, how much and where are we using it? So we're having Paul Kamen join us. Um, he's also on the Water Management Committee and is also an East Island Water Utility Manager. Um, we also want to know, what is our local habitat? What do we need for our ecosystems? And so we have um, Kimball Sumber, who's going to touch on that and maybe some of the things of what we don't know, which is also important. Um, agricultural needs, we're a big agricultural community. What do we know about how much is happening? So we're having um, Tom Schultz give us a little bit on that. Um, former director of the Extension, the Washington State um, University Extension. And then we wanted to look a little bit about current local and state water use regulations. And this would also include reclaimed water, water in catchment, gray water systems. So we're gonna have a few different speakers to speak to that. Um, Kyle Dodd, who's part of the San Juan County Health and Community Service, the Environmental um, Services Health Manager, health manager. Um, and Peter Kilpatrick, who's helped do some installations and creating some systems, um, some of which have been able to be hooked up and some of them have it, to kind of give us an overview. Um, and again, Paul came in to help us look at um, some desal systems. Um, I could do a little bio on these guys, but I thought maybe we'd just let them introduce themselves before we get started. Yeah. Um, should we do the format first? Sure, sure. We'll just uh, finish this off real quick. First off, um, since we're blasting through this first part, we really want us to get a lot of good time for people to ask questions and have that discussion. Let's hold all questions until we get to the Q&A period. Uh, so the, the panel discussion, then question and answer um, period. Um, the next steps, there's also going to be a little uh, forum getting passed around here that's a survey that will really help us um, in asking the right questions, moving, taking this discussion to the next spot, where one thing we'd like to do is form a task force or work group that starts working on some of these issues um, that come, come up both to light tonight, um, as well as figuring out um, more about what it is that we need to know. And this is specific to this climate action plan, not um, trying to duplicate the efforts of the water resource management. They might work in tandem. Uh, and for us, we're still looking for funding. Um, so anybody who has ideas uh, for helping fund this initiative on a bigger level, we're certainly um, interested in learning about that from you as well. And then outreach events, additional sector work groups. Um, this won't be the end of uh, the work that we're doing for Islands Climate Resilient. You'll see us uh, continuing to pop up um, through the winter, into the spring, uh, trying to do this with some other sectors other than just freshwater resources. So uh, with that, I think we should, these guys, Introduce themselves and yeah. we just have to introduce themselves. 
San Juan County Health and Community Services. Tom Schultz, um, retired from Washington State University Extension, was here for 22 years as the county director. Agriculture is one of the things ex Extension um, advises on, but there's also 4-H and environmental programs going on for the British Extension. But um, I want to underline I'm retired. No, retired last <laughs> July. <laughs> and it's wonderful for any of you there. <laughs> Pete Kilpatrick, Raven Hill Construction. I'm not retired quite yet. I'm Kimball Sunberg. Um, I live on San Juan Island permanently since 2000. Um, I've owned property here since the uh, mid 1980s. And I uh, retired from Alaska Department of Fishing Game as a habitat biologist. And when I moved here, I got involved in uh, several. Uh, committees like a lot of people who move here with uh, professional backgrounds and so I was uh, I'm on the water resources management committee and also on the um, uh, Salmon recovery technical advisory group and I also advise the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, on their uh, habitat uh, hydraulic code so um, I stay involved in fish issues and aquatic issues my name is Paul Kamen. I'm the general manager at East Sound Water Users Association over on Orcas Island. We serve about half of the population on Orcas. Uh, I'm a member of the Water Resources Committee since about 2005. Great. So we'll um, start off um, with Vicki. Okay. So this is a um, sketch of what our geology looks like. The gray areas are um, glacial deposits, sands and gravels, which hold, tend to be porous and hold water. Most of the county actually is bedrock, so a lot of our groundwater is captured in bedrock, which is fractures in the rock. Water quality issues, seawater intrusion. Faults and fractures convey water in the bedrock wells, which can also be a channel where surface, surface contaminants can get into the water. Naturally occurring contaminants are arsenic, barium, and fluoride. Common secondary contaminants are sodium, iron, and manganese. Um, testing is always uh, an issue as far as checking on water quality in the county. Community water systems, public water systems are required to test, but people with private wells are not. 
seawater intrusion is a major concern in the county. Um, in the past, we've used chloride as an indicator for that, but we found that it can be a false indicator because there's other <coughs> um, situations that um, create a level of high chloride. The reality is dynamic. Our aquifers are dynamic. In an island environment, the water is constantly flowing outward toward the sea. So water quality levels change seasonally. Water availability, the availability of water changes seasonally. Um, for seawater intrusion, uh, we've, um, our goal has been to show where risk areas are. <coughs> this is just a simple graphic showing the, the cattle point wells, and that became, in, um, this is a well situation where seawater intrusion occurred. This is a water system out there at Cattle Point. Um, eventually their wells became too salty to use and are pretty much um, set aside and they're mainly using uh, desalination. What we found over time in the last 15 years of looking at water quality issues with the Water Resource Committee is that for seawater intrusion, what we really need to be looking at is water levels. This is the most recent study that was conducted in, on Lopez, and this is kind of a rough graphic, but basically we're looking at the north end of Lopez, and you can see where the seawater interface is affecting the fresh water of the, the large blue area there. This is an area that's highly contentious right now because um, uh, the water systems there, uh, some of them are struggling to keep seawater intrusion at bay. And um, there's an effort to consolidate there. A lot of public concern about what's going on. So <clears throat> in the past, our best available science has been looking at fluorides. And now we're moving to look at, at actual water levels. We have two mon groundwater monitoring networks in the county, one on the north end of Lopez and one in East Sound. Um, the uh, north end of Lopez, the water levels there are a concern because they are in indicating that there is a risk of seawater intrusion. <coughs> um, this is a graphic of the map that we're using at this time to um, for seawater intrusion risk. The circles are wells that have high chloride concentrations and then we have a buffer around the shoreline as well. So assessing the problems in the last 15 years, we started out looking at well log data. Um, and what we saw there was that well production varies seasonally. Re recharge occurs from November to April. Um, aquifer capacity is a percentage of that recharge. This is what the USGS data looks like. So you can see that these areas with high recharge correspond with the glacial deposits, the, the sands and gravels. So the light green areas are This is what was the shocker after we did this analysis with USGS. USGS also did a recharge analysis for Whitby, Camino, for Island County, and for the Swim Dungeness area. Um, Swim Dungeness does have recharge from river, river flow as well. But for San Juan County, you can see that our recharge is really a tiny percent of our annual rainfall. And of course, as you all know, we're in the rain shadow, so our rainfall is also less than, than what you see on the mainland. Whitby, Camino, and Squim, of course, are also in the rain shadow. But um, you can see they have a much more robust situation there as far as the amount of recharge that they have. So mainly we've been, I've been talking about um, recharge to groundwater and into wells. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people um, don't realize in San Juan County is that actually about 40% of the population
population is served by surface water sources. The town of Quite Harbor, quite a bit of East Downs water, Roach Harbor, um, Rosario, Doe Bay, Olga. The, several of the major population centers in the county are served by surface water sources. And as Paul will explain later on, we, we are seeing much more frequency of use of desalination. And you can see why. You can see why. So this is what we've been doing. Uh, in 2004, we completed a major countywide uh, resource management plan, which is available online for those of you that want to get into more detail. The goals of the Water Resource Management Committee that came out of all of this, this initial planning effort here And we've done three sub-area reports in San Juan County. Okay. Um, one at East Orcas, one on Lopez, and one in the East Sound area. This is a list of the reports and studies that have been produced in the last 15 years. And that's the only time. I have... Um, I made copies of the, the current water quality results here and um, I'd be glad to talk to anybody about them that's interested in them. Um, and um, so I'm going to pass on. per day. <coughs> Remember that number because I'll put that into a local context. But you can look at different places including here's the UK. So using a third of the water we are, would you argue that our quality of life is substantially better than those in the UK? No. Cheers. <laughs> In the United States, the vast majority of our water is used in agriculture. We do not know, or I do not, it, Tom does, what the percentage of San Juan Car County's water use is used by domestic sources. But that's a key part of an equation. In your home, the majority of your water, again, goes to outdoor use. Toilets are your second highest users of your water, and stunningly, at least 10%, I've seen that number significantly higher, is gone to leaks. So one of the themes of, that I want to offer is that we can maintain the quality of life uh, using significantly less water than we currently are. Okay. San Juan County is a, a unique area, and understanding where our water goes, which was one of the key questions that was asked of me, you have to understand how we get our water. So 57% of the population in the county is served by Group A water systems. Those are water systems, the larger water systems, Friday Harbor and East Sound and Lopez Village, but water, all water systems above 15, 15 connections and larger. So many of us are that way. These were regulated by the state. Uh, the Group B systems are smaller systems, uh, two, three party up to 14 party. Okay? So smaller systems. These systems are regulated by the county. In the state of Washington, 2% of the population is served by Group B. 
In San Juan County, our number is almost 10 times that. Okay? And then a, a significant portion of us are served by uh, standalone systems that are, after being approved, unregulated. So this is a little bit more detail on the differences between the two. What I wanted to highlight is that the reporting requirements for Group A water systems are significant. We track all the water usage. We are required by law to have meters on all of our services and all of our production. Uh, group B systems are required to meter, but uh, they have no reporting requirements. So significant portion of the county, we don't have that. And there are no monitoring and reporting requirements for the smaller systems. So to try to get a total picture of how much water is used in the county, we have some challenges with that. I mentioned in the United States, 150 gallons per person is average. So here's some local numbers. In Seattle, the number is like 130 gallons. In Friday Harbor, it's 110 or so. And in East Sound, we're functioning in under 90 gallons per person at this time. This is a common trend that we've seen throughout the Northwest, that uh, as the number of connections in the water systems increases, the total demand of water on the systems has been declining. That's a result of conservation, both at the consumer side and also on the utility side. And that's an important trend that I see still continuing. So another example, in East Sound in 2000, we used 85,000 gallons per equivalent residential unit. And in 2013, it was down to 50,000. And that's not a unique trend just to East Sound. I can quote similar numbers to Friday Harbor or Seattle. Professional management of water systems can pay dividends. Here's a curiosity. Who uses the water? And how much we use? Uh, this is, a, again, an East Sound or an Orcas uh, study, but Bonnie Bray and Wild Rose Meadow are part of uh, affordable housing developments. The size of these homes is 1,200 to 1,600 square feet, um, significantly smaller than the average home in the county. The size of the home doesn't matter. Number of people in the home matters. We face a significant challenge with when it rains and when the highest water use is. So this is a graph of what the, the demand is of water, and it's the same graph for most users in the, in the county. In the early part of the year, demand is very low. We get the peak season, and we're looking at uh, almost a tripling of demand during the summer when the water resource is least available. Most challenge. We're not getting the rain. So we're going to talk a little bit about what makes differences. I'm a big proponent of uh, price makes a difference. And people, but some people, and I think many in this room, will adjust their behavior because it's the right thing to do. But we do not represent the majority. And I think paying for what you get is an important part of any equation. But what can you do? That was another key question. So the first thing I say is no matter what, how you're served, you need to be metered. And it's not very expensive to put a meter on your house. And it's even less expensive to put a little device like this on the end of your hose so you know how much water is going into your garden, which is a significant portion of your water use during the time when water systems are most significantly challenged. Having the meter there isn't the only thing. You've got to read it, and you've got to write it down. For those who have a private well, I, I, this summer was a unique situation. In June, I started getting calls with not East Sound Water members. My well is dry. What's going on? <laughs> or how can I buy water from East Sound because mine isn't providing me anything? 
I get those calls in August all the time, but to start getting them in June was a real oddity. Um, to prevent that from happening to you, you need to know how much water is in your well. You need to fix your leaks. You can do this at your house and save significantly. Mindful, wise, prudent irrigation can make a huge difference. Replace your toilet. Again, a large portion, over 25% of the water use in your home is uh, through your toilet. If you've got a toilet that predates 1996, it probably needs to be replaced to a lower volume. And that will save you almost 20%. So now what can we do as a county? I'm a big advocate that all water sources, all water use needs to be metered. Um, I'd like to see us adopt water use efficiency goals for our Group B water systems. The state requires Group A water systems to lose no more than 10% of their water uh, that they produce through leaks in their distribution system. But there are systems in this county where half of the water that they produce is lost in leaks. Uh, I would like to see San Juan County get a handle on how much water is used in uh, the irrigation side of things and in agriculture. We need to absolutely, as Vicki mentioned, continue to monitor closely for seawater intrusion issues and specifically on the island of Lopez. We have lived for the last uh, 15 years with water resource planning by, uh, funded by the state. And that money's gone. And we need to, we're now being asked to take responsibility for monitoring our own uh, water resources. And there's discussions around building a water resource, a clean water district in San Juan County. And I think we should be looking at that partly to fund a uh, in-house hydrogeologist we have a stormwater expert full-time on staff. We have a wide variety of other folks that way. I think we benefit from having a hydrogeologist. And then I'd like to see us advocate for uh, state rules that will allow the treatment of our sewer effluent back into uh, water reuse, directly to potable water reuse. That's a huge uh, resource that we are currently sending out into the south. And it's doable. It's been done in many places around the world. Our state just isn't there yet in permitting it. I think we could be advocates for moving that forward. I'm going to stand up, I call. But um, I'm a little more soft spoken, so I'll use this microphone. So, what I'm going to do is uh, just give you a brief summary of uh, freshwater habitats in the San Juan Islands. And uh, it's going to be very general. Um, time doesn't allow it to go into a lot of complexity. But essentially, uh, we can break our freshwater habitats into three different categories. Um, freshwater marshes and ponds, and that would include uh, wetlands uh, as a bigger subset of that, but wetlands also includes things like flooded, seasonally flooded pasture areas and other areas, but uh, primarily the habitat uh, that I'm looking at are ones that have continuous water in them year round. And then we have uh, small streams in the San Juan, because we're an island small island community, none of our streams are very big. I mean, I used to work in Alaska, big rivers with lots of salmon, you get here to the San Juans, and a big, a big stream is like that yeah. Cascade Creek on the right. So that's a major stream in the San Juan Islands. Many of them are much smaller. Uh, most of them are perennial, so they go dry during the summertime, or parts of them go dry. Um, so we deal with a real small scale uh, stream uh, systems here. Nonetheless, they're very interesting and some of them are uh, actually fairly productive. 
And then we have a lot of lakes and ponds. Um, this is a picture of San Juan Valley with Zilstra Lake. Um, and you can see not only this large you know, lake, which is an impounded lake, but a lot of people have put ponds on their property. And most of our freshwater habitats in the San Juans are, are um, on private land. So um, landowners have modified the landscape to meet their own needs, um, beginning uh, largely with agriculture and then progressing to the, the modern era where you know, people have a home, they want to have some water or pond or something like that, or a little lake system or something. And so they build these systems, um, and uh, we have a lot of them here in San Juan County. And they have impacts on the natural habitats, um, not only because the, the natural stream courses were modified in many cases to create these, but they also increase the evapotranspiration during the summertime when it's hot. So this shows our annual precipitation. This is what drives our freshwater habitats. And the San Juans have a very uh, interesting uh, hydrologic or annual precipitation cycle, which is directly related to how much water is available. Vicki said all of our water here comes from rainfall. So this is the rainfall. This is a um, graph of 30 years uh, of what's called a normal uh, uh, precipitation graph that's based on actual data. And so our average annual precipitation is about 24 inches. Um, it varies in the county over in Orcas, it's, uh, it's higher, it's over 30. In south end of Lopez and south end of San Juan, uh, west side of San Juan Island where I live, it's more like you know, 23 inches, 22, 23 inches. But you see this peak, which everybody's been seeing for the last two, uh, two weeks here, is November, we get this big spike of uh, rainfall, and that's what gives us the, uh, the highest uh, rainfall of the year. And interestingly, I was just looking at my own rain gauge data, and we just hit four inches um, as of this last rainfall, not including what's gonna be coming here in the next few days. So we're already at this peak level, and we've still got a half of a month to go. So we're <clears throat> likely gonna uh, greatly exceed the uh, average monthly rainfall here in November. And then it drops off in December, and it just keeps getting on down until July, you can only get about a half an inch of rain, and that's the dry season. So I always tell people, they say, what's the weather like in the San Juan's? I say, it's like Australia, there's a wet season and a dry season. So what do these, this rainfall produce? Well, it's produced a lot of these little stream systems um, and lakes, uh, throughout the islands, and these stream systems have been surveyed recently, as recently as the uh, last uh, three, four years um, by Wild Fish Conservancy and others. They've walked these streams and they've, and they've uh, trapped them and shocked them to find out what's in them. And a lot of them, these red lines are all streams that have salmonids, and salmonids is a group of fish that includes trout uh, and salmon. Now primarily, we have things like cutthroat trout and rainbow trout in our streams. The salmon are pretty much confined to the lower um, parts of the larger streams, and they are mostly in the juvenile stage, very few adult salmon. The San Juan's never historically had any big salmon runs. There were some small salmon runs for coos and chums, um, and, but the modifications that have occurred to all the stream systems have um, decrease the amount of uh, spawning habitat for fish. So now our streams primarily provide rearing habitat for juvenile salmon, which come in from the ocean, maybe use the stream for a couple months in the summer to eat insects, go back out into to, uh, salt water. But they do provide habitat year round for rainbow trout and uh, cutthroat trout. And cutthroat trout is another anadromous fish. Anadromous means fish that go between fresh water and salt water. Uh, coastal cutthroat trout, like up in Garrison Creek um, and in San Juan Valley Creek, um, historically spawned in these little streams and uh, go out in the ocean to feed and uh, actually could grow up to pretty good size. That's the same picture of Lopez. And Orcas Island. 
And our islands are very different. I mean, San Juan's just kind of a mixture of some mountains and big valleys. So Orcas Island's very mountainous, it's got much higher terrain, so that it's got more rainfall, more uh, stream flow. And Lopez is kind of uh, low and, uh, and uh, more low gradient. And so this is what's happened to some of our streams uh, in, uh, in the islands. And this is, can you find a stream here? I mean, the, originally, before this was an agricultural land, there was a stream that went down through here, but now because of livestock grazing and water impoundments, this is what we end up with. It's basically no stream channel. And one thing that I learned about fish is that they do have to have water. So if you don't have water, you're not going to have fish, or if you have water for only six months of the year and then it dries up for six months of the year, what are the fish going to do? So uh, you have to have pretty much continuous flow and you have to have places for fish to go when, uh, during the dry season. Anyways, <clears throat> um, this was a slide just basically to show that uh, this is West Beach Creek, uh, Creek restoration and the uh, amount of effort it takes to restore a stream that's been degraded is considerable. Let's see if I can get this to go back. Whoops. This is like jumping twice. Okay. So the, what I was showing you with the excavator, this is what this looked like before it was restored. So essentially a homeowner had built a dam across it, built a pond for their property, put these two culverts in there. Well, this is a anatomous fish stream, so it's for 25 years, this is all fish couldn't get up through here. Um, they can't jump into that, that little culvert like that. So um, this is what it takes to actually restore that stream, and that uh, was done recently with salmon restoration funds. And now fish can go up and down. Okay. Um, in straight flow. So basically, uh, what we're, the goal is is to try to reserve water in streams so that there's a guaranteed amount of water for fish and other habitat, uh, wildlife habitat to use. The point of this is, is it's a lot easier to protect habitat rather than go back and restore it. Here's another uh, fish restoration project on uh, Cascade Creek, which uh, basically removed this uh, road prism and a small culvert and replaced it with a bridge, and now uh, fish have access, free access in and out. So in summary, freshwater habitats are vital to maintain our biodiversity and natural resources. That freshwater habitats, they support living amenities, by that I mean they're things that people really value uh, in the San Juans, being able to go see docks or swans or, or go fishing and that kind of thing. It enhances the property values and obviously is an attraction for tourists. Um, <clears throat> the San Juans or freshwater habitats have been altered through water appropriation, ditching, livestock grazing, invasive species and fish blockages. Those are all challenges that resource managers deal with on a day-to-day -day basis here, uh, trying to make improvements. Um, we can protect and restore freshwater habitats to provide sustainable benefits. That's been proven by any of the projects that are underway and have been done in the past. And it requires cooperation of landowners, but if we can get cooperation from private landowners, there is funding and technical assistance available to achieve our goals. Very good. <clears throat> so um, again, I'm Tom Schultz, and I'm going to uh, talk uh, all about agriculture in a way that um, that I was asked to. So I wasn't asked to do a presentation. I was given four questions. And what you see up behind me are the four questions I um, was asked to answer. So I'm going to do my best to to try to answer them. Getting hard numbers for a lot of these questions uh, proved to be very difficult. Um, 
I really, I was asked to come here and talk about three weeks ago and actually recommended somebody that would have been better than myself. That person slipped out of town <laughs> last week. So I was, um, about a week ago I was asked to uh, come to this. So I uh, had about three or four days to put some numbers together. And I'm not a water expert. Um, I was a plant pathologist uh, by training, so a kind of nerdy thing, but um, nonetheless, I uh, got exposed to a lot of agriculture in the last 20 years. So I was here. So um, I don't think, Paul, I'm going to be able to answer some of the questions you asked me, because uh, getting those numbers, particularly from farmers, is extremely difficult, um, even you know, if I would have had months to do this. So I'm going to try to answer these, uh, these four questions. And um, the last few days, I've contacted seven farmers, and I, I was able to get responses from five of them on three islands, just to get their experience was over the last summer. And that was, uh, that was very interesting. Um, and I'll share some of that with you. I won't mention names, but these people, I, I always tell people, you know. So what are our agricultural water needs? Um, and my answer, flat answer is it depends um, and, and that's on what uh, and where. So what is grown and where it's grown. And it's highly variable um, all, all, all over the county. So the where would be things like the location of the farm, obviously, the soil types, the different soil types hold moisture better than other soil types. Um, they get alluded a little bit to this, but um, rocky surfaces, uh, coarse soils, things run faster. And our glacial till with uh, clay in it. And we've had enough clay, but um, that will hold soil. So those are the loams and the, the uh, uh, clay loams and the silt loams, which are probably overall in general our best soils that we have here, because they hold they hold water. And I'll talk a little bit more why that's important. And the microclimates, you know, um, sun exposure, temperature, um, and wind all play a part. How much water is needed to grow something? So as far as what is grown, um, I threw things into five categories. Um, I have grass, um, hay uh, forages. This would be pastures and land used for hay. And acreage-wise, this is um, by far the uh, covers the most acreage uh, of all of agriculture. Is, is growing grass hay and grass pasture um, as a base for livestock. Um, so, and nearly all of that, uh, and maybe 5% less than 5% of that uh, grass pasture, grass hayland, is grown under dry land management. In other words, no irrigation is done. And it's totally dependent on rainfall and what happens during the summer. Uh, other categories, grains, used to be very popular, used to take up a lot more acreage. Uh, grains are starting to make a comeback um, now, and grains are grown also under dry land agriculture, do not need any irrigation. Um, and most of the grains here are spring planted. Um, a lot of them can also be fall planted, but um, the, the culture is here is to um, plant them in the spring. Next category would be fruit and berries. And uh, once mature, fruit trees and even berries can produce uh, without irrigation. I've seen a lot of orchards um, that have no irrigation, but uh, the benefit of irrigating them is that production definitely goes up and quality of fruit definitely goes up. So most of the fruit in, uh, in berry production is irrigated, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. Um, fourth category, vegetables. And I will say that vegetables are the highest use uh, agricultural and for the water, the most water use crop um, that's grown. And different uh, farmers have different ideas about the highest use vegetable they grow. Was it was, it was interesting, but um, things like uh, the cabbage family is way up there. Potatoes are way up there. Leafy greens are way up there. But they uh, they do require water um, and consistent. The dry period. Uh, last is livestock. Um, and livestock get most of their water from the from green forage that they're eating, you know, the green grasses. Uh, however, they do need to have uh, free water all year round. But the amount of water they use on a daily basis is not that great because they're getting most of the water from what they're eating. 
Uh, I talked to one rancher who has um, between one and 200 head of cattle here, and um, he was able to get his figures pretty precisely about the water he used. Um, and it came up to five gallons per animal per day, uh, which was less than, uh, I thought less than I read um, in some of the university publications from other states. We, we don't have a lot of information about um, cattle in Western Washington, but um, we do have some in Eastern Washington and from California and other states, and it's a little higher in those places. Um, how's water obtained? Um, so it, obviously, the ultimate source is the rainfall. We've heard that twice before. And it's rainfall that's held in soil. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the largest reservoir of water for agriculture, is that which is in the soil. And as I mentioned before, most of the acreage in agriculture is dry land. It's not irrigated. Um, also, there's a, a significant amount of water coming from impoundments. These would be small lakes and ponds. Um, the county is pockmarked with ponds if you've ever flown over. They're, they're, they're catching surface water. Um, and also wells um, are used, and it's sometimes a combination of pond water and wells. Usually the ponds are the priority, and when the pond goes dry, right, people will start pumping more wells. There are some farms that use wells solely. Um, but both can be used, and uh, um, there are some streams that are used um, actually for irrigating livestock. Um, that probably is a very small percentage of animals um, on the total. Uh, second question, how, what, when and how is water a limiting factor in agriculture? Well, if it's frozen, it certainly can't be good, and that's a better problem. Um, but uh, during the growing season, during the warm season, amount that is insufficient to produce the, the crop you want. Plants can survive on a um, limited amount of water, but they're not going to produce really well if they don't have um, sufficient water. And of course, that season is with spring through fall as a rule. It's the dry season, and every summer is dry. Uh, even in uh, western Washington, we, look at that, we really have a drought every single year. Um, so we're Pretty much used to that. Um, and we just got to that one. So, third question, really quickly: Will water shortages change which crops can be grown? And I'm making the assumption that we have less water. And I'll say yes and no. But many of the same or similar crops uh, can be grown using different types of management. I'll talk more about this during the panel. But technology has made irrigating much more efficient than it used to be. Um, practices of mulching, biodegradable types of mulches. And no-till, it's just something relatively new. Last question is, what does the future of agriculture production uh, look like in the county? I'm just going to say challenging. Um, uh, farms are getting smaller. There, there are fewer livestock. Fortunately, the farm gate, what people are getting, the prices are getting, has gone up. So that's good. And it's uh, going to be challenging, not so much from a lack of water. Um, it's going to be challenging due to a lot of other things, cost of land. Um, average age of farmers is approaching 60 now, so getting young people to, to, uh, to farm. But there's a level of resiliency in agriculture. Farmers can plan if they know ahead what's going to happen. They can make changes um, and plan at different times of year. They're very flexible. If, we, if any of you heard Chad Kruger um, two summers ago during climate change talks that we had all summer. And I've heard Chad, he's with Washington State University. Um, I've heard him talk um, two or three times now, and uh, he's, he was talking, he always talks about the resiliency of agriculture. It's gonna be able to adapt to a lot of these climate changes. And it's not so much the, the water, there's gonna be a huge lack of water here in the Northwest, but the patterns of the water is, is coming uh, with change. So I'll stop there. And, Great. So again, I'm going to came in late. I'm Kyle Dodd, the environmental health manager for San Juan County Health and Community Services. And 
as usual, the topic that I'm given to speak about isn't isn't the most glamorous. Here. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the that's the profession that uh, I've, cho I've chosen. So uh, here we go. And uh, much much like Tom, um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview um, of the current state of gray water systems. Um, speaking from state regulation and county regulation, and hope to just uh, spur any any questions and discuss in, in detail um, during the Q&A. Okay, so what is gray water? And, and again, um, I apologize if a lot of this is basic, but I never like to, like to make any assumptions when I give presentations. So uh, just, just to define it, um, it's essentially the wastewater from, you know, bathtubs, uh, sinks, washing machines, and it, it, essentially uh, all sewage, and, and sewage is uh, the water that carries human waste from the residents that don't come into contact with toilet waste. So if you, if you think about uh, toilet waste separately, um, all, all else that uh, is generated from the residents is, is essentially gray water. And it is considered sewage under both the uh, state on-site sewage code and the local um, on-site sewage code. Uh, every so often we'll run into a, a property owner um, that, that doesn't necessarily subscribe to that, um, but it, it definitely is a sewage. Uh, it does contain uh, bacteria, viruses, and other uh, things that can cause disease, um, and that's exactly why uh, we have the codes and, and requirements on how it must be handled. So what do the systems consist of? Uh, essentially when, uh, and, and I'm going to speak from the perspective um, of using gray water for, for treatment and dispersal um, in, in this uh, segment here. It essentially consists of, of the same components uh, that a combined uh, on-site sewage system consists of. And when I, when I talk about combined, that's gray water and black water, or a standard residential system. So uh, both state and, and county code require a septic tank. Uh, granted, there aren't the heavy solids um, that, that there are in combined wastewater, but there still are some solids in gray water. Uh, the purpose of a septic tank is to um, ensure that, that wastes are retained uh, for a certain period of time so that the lighter materials can, can float to the top and the heavier materials to the bottom and also uh, initiates the uh, anaerobic treatment process. So a septic tank is, is still required for, for gray water systems. Um, a pump chamber may also be required to pressurize um, the drain fuel. I think I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, in the next bullet point. And also a subsurface drain field. Again, we talked about gray water being defined as a sewage, and in Washington State, all sewage uh, must be disposed of subsurface. So there is no spray irrigation here. Um, everything uh, gets dispersed below ground. So soil depth requirements uh, set back to property lines and wells. And again, those are the same as uh, combined systems. Again, this, this is a sewage. Granted, you can argue that it's, it's a little less innocuous, um, but there still are fecal coal form there. It does, uh, it, it does contain pathogens uh, from coming in contact with, with some human waste there. So all, all the setbacks and, and permitting requirements are going to be the same for, for gray water systems. Um, the soil depth, that's, that's what's going to drive uh, the system type. So much like uh, a lot of you are familiar with on-site sewage systems uh, living here. That's, a lot of our residents are served by them. Um, some of you may question, why do I have a certain system type? And that's essentially driven by the depth of available soil before you encounter either a water table or some other restrictive layer like bedrock. So the shallower the soil, the more pretreatment and or pressurization um, is required. It's, it, there are some uh, deeper soils here that, that do provide for uh, gravity distribution, uh, but the, 
majority of, of the systems uh, that we have here we have very shallow soils, therefore pressure distribution is required. And if you're talking about a gray water system, then that means you have a pump tank uh, behind your septic tank. One of the benefits of a, a gray water system is that the, the size can be reduced by up to 50% um, from a conventional uh, combined system. Uh, sizing is um, is, is essentially the square foot of uh, drain field or, or dispersal area that you need. Um, and that's based on the soil texture. So um, very coarse soils obviously uh, can be loaded at higher rates than some of the finer soils. You know, Tom talked about the, the clay loams. Those are some of the, the tighter soils that we have around here. And because uh, those soils can't uh, readily accept large volumes of effluent, um, then we have to make the drain field sizes very large when you're in those very tight soils. So the, uh, no, a normal combined system would be sized based on 120 gallons per person, um, actually per bedroom, um, per day. So uh, a, a gray water system, you can reduce that by uh, up to half down to 60 gallons uh, per day. So that's, that, that's one of the benefits of, of splitting them out. So this is my last slide here. I'm just gonna talk about a few uh, design considerations. So when folks uh, call us or walk into our office and, and they wanna talk about um, a, a gray water system, uh, we always have to let them know that you, you do have the black water that you need to deal with. And uh, if they choose to go down that that route of uh, having a, a designer design them a gray water system, uh, then they will need to have either a, an incinerating or a composting toilet uh, to handle the black water. If they, if they end up going down the path of completely separating them. Um, their State Department of Health has a, an approved list of registered composting and incinerating toilets uh, that must be selected uh, as part of the permit process when you are uh, proposing a, a separate gray water system. The gray water system must uh, provide for year-round treatment. Again, we're talking about um, treating and dispersing all the sewage that's generated from the household uh, year-round. So uh, everything that is, uh, makes it into the plumbing uh, needs to be treated and dispersed. This isn't just a, a seasonal type system. Be capable of handling uh, year round. And then uh, the final bullet point there uh, combined systems uh, utilizing subsurface drip uh, allow for use of flushing toilets uh, and the benefit of subsurface uh, irrigation. So, a lot of times when, when folks come to us and start talking about having complete uh, separate systems, um, some, of the, some of the real dedicated ones do. They end up with incinerating or composting toilets and a separate drain field uh, for their gray water. Um, but some choose to have uh, the convenience of flushing toilets and you can still route all your uh, sewage into one combined system and have the benefit of, of sub subsurface drip irrigation. So I think I'll leave it there and answer your questions later. So I'm going to uh, talk on rainwater collection systems. And uh, if actually if I have any time left, I'd like to say a little bit about um, reclaimed water systems. Uh, so as I said, I own Raven Hill Construction, and we build custom homes all over the county, and have installed a lot of catchment systems as part of the projects that we've done for over 20 years. So it's it's well established here, and. and definitely has a, a big impact on the water situation in the county. Um, but it's important to first off mention the um, potential impact on aquifer recharge on reclaimed water systems because it is, is interrupting the uh, flow of water from rainfall into the aquifer. So um, I'm going to reference actually a great paper um, that uh, 
is really good reference on systems and the impact of aquifer research it is from the San Juan County Water Resources Management Plan, uh, which Vicki kind of referenced from 2004. And a part of that is a paper written by Ron Mayo from Lopez on um, the hydrologic impact of in water catchment systems on the groundwater of San, the San Juan Islands. And I really, the conclusion is that um, our kind of private rainwater collection systems have pretty minimal impact on aquifer research. So, kind of full speed ahead on that. Um, so, I, as I said, uh, we've installed a lot of systems. Most of them, um, there's really two types of rainwater collection systems. One is uh, the type that we do most often for um, really just for use of irrigation and. Um, you know, irrigation potential uses so much water, garden, landscaping, that it, uh, it can really take the pressure off some of our low producing wells. But San Juan County is one of the few counties that also allows rainwater catchment for primary domestic water use. Um, and there's, the system is pretty much the same for both types uh, of collection, but there's some important final steps, of course, in using water collection for domestic water. Uh, so the permitting process is actually through um, San Juan County Health Department, and is part of the um, is really part of the kind of proof of water. Um, and there's actually a, a form, the rainwater catchment checklist that the county requires uh, for rainwater systems that. Um, this is a pretty important form. It, it basically, uh, you have to show how much water you're collecting and that it's adequate for your use for a year. So that really helps with a lot of aspects of the design of the system. Um, so the components, uh, depending of course on whether you're using uh, rainwater collection for irrigation or domestic use, um, really starts with, of course, rain falling on the roof. What type of roofing is fairly obvious that metal roofs are used most commonly. Uh, comp roofs are not great because of uh, material coming off the roofs. So that's, a, that's an important consideration. Um, from the roof, water flows into gutters and downspouts. Um, we usually use kind of oversized downspouts so water can flow adequately and not, not, get, uh, uh, not get caught. And actually that brings up a you know, pretty important consideration with rainwater collection is that there's a lot of maintenance involved. It's not a system that you can just build and forget. Um, you do have to have a uh, maintenance plan which includes keeping gutters clean, keeping tanks clean, um, so it's, uh, it's not like, you know, most water systems that you really <coughs> uh, So onward downspouts are connected into hard piping underground, um, which is really uh, put together almost like plumbing. Um, fittings include uh, everything flowing into a collection tank. From a collection tank, uh, which is uh, a small tank with a sump pump, which is another component that needs to be kept clean. Uh, water pumps up into storage tanks. And really, storage tanks are the biggest, the biggest uh, component of rainwater collection systems, with sizing tanks, a uh, location type, um, calculating uh, how much water you need for the months when it's really not raining. It's, it's a lot of water. Um, and really, we almost started 10,000 gallons of storage on up um, that a tank for uh, providing domestic water for a house is going to be 20,000 20, gallons and on up. So it's, it's a lot of storage. Um, so most often we've been using uh, 5,000 gallon plastic tanks um, that you can combine in series. Those can be placed almost anywhere that you can pump to, so, so location is pretty easy. Um, from 
them from tanks. Uh, there's normally there's a pump, a submersible pump in the tank that pumps to a, pr a pressure tank, and from there, uh, really out to uh, your irrigation sources. So that's that's the basic system for irrigating gardens and landscaping. Um, and I've got an important note that uh, that a code requirement and uh, something we do for all piping, for all hose bibs, anything that um, conveys non-potable water has to be purple. It's kind of the standard purple piping, uh, purple hydrants um, is just kind of the universal sign that you don't tie into a purple pipe for domestic water. So um, that is Then the next step, if you are using uh, rainwater collection water for domestic use, uh, filtering filtering systems are actually again fairly simple. Nothing really high tech. Uh, we usually send water through a carbon filter first for cleaning up color, kind of initial filtering, uh, cartridge filters um, that uh, that filters everything before it goes to the main. Uh, ultraviolet filter, which um, is really what the final final treatment is. And from there, um, that water can be used for just about everything. But again, all those components require uh, a degree of maintenance that um, has, to be, has to be reported. Um, so a final, actually another important note on um, uh, Rainwater collection is during the, during the winter months when tanks are overflowing. That it's important that that water also be um, treated as stormwater runoff and can't just be um, can't just be directed without uh, treating it as uh, part of your stormwater plan. So that's a, that's another important component. Um, so those are those are kind of the highlights of. Their systems are now. So, how much time? We're about two more minutes. Okay. Yeah. So I I kind of like to jump uh, quickly to um, reclaimed water systems, um, which Paul mentioned briefly. That uh, that also has has great potential in San Juan County. That um, I was uh, I'm heavily involved with the San Juan Home Trust, mm -hmm. and many people might know that uh, our Sunrise community built a sewer system that eventually can handle up to 200 homes. And it's uh, based on a system that is set up to use the reclaimed water back through toilets and for irrigation. And can really significantly, I think you saw the pie chart in terms of how much water is used in homes for just those two things. It's, I, my guess is it's up to half. And our system right now is really um, treats the wastewater to the point where it's drinkable. And um, it's at a point where all we need to do is open a valve and it, uh, it's ready to go back through houses, back through toilets and irrigation. But it's currently not approved for, uh, for residential use in Washington State. And Washington State Department of Health is just kind of not moving on it. So, in the county, reclaimed water has huge potential in terms of uh, cutting our water use, and it's just become, uh, unfortunately, kind of a political uh, move that um, that we can kind of get moving in Olympia. But uh, so that's that. listen to me one more time. So I wanted to cover the topic of desalinization in uh, San Juan County. Uh, San Juan County has 15 of the state's 19 desalinization facilities. Uh, Washington has more desalinization facilities than any other state in the nation. Surprisingly. In Florida, in Texas, in California, it's being pursued on a large scale. In San Juan County, we don't do large scale. 
Um, uh, but even with those statistics, uh, only 4% uh, of the county's population is currently served by desalinization. The uh, two largest facilities are in Spring Point on Orcas, which has 90 homes, but the desalinization augments surface water. And then Vicki showed the Cattle Point system, which has now moved from wells to fully desal, and that's 55 connections. So all together around the county, about 700 people served. The largest facility serves 2,000 or 25,000 gallons uh, is their peak production. San Juan County supports desalinization in its codes as the uh, primary water source for new development. Okay. But it is the water source of last resort. Okay. It's expensive. It's energy intensive. It requires permitting through no less than 12 agencies. So uh, if you've got a property located in the county, mostly this is shoreline properties that are very valuable and there isn't water available, people have pursued desalinization with success. Um, these systems, as Tom mentioned with the rain catchment, uh, intensive use for people in terms of maintenance and costly to maintain. In the industry of desalinization, in the last 10 years, the energy required uh, to create water through them has dropped by two-thirds. There have been huge benefits in energy recovery. Um, and it's important for water use in all kinds of places. Israel gets over 80% of their water through desalinization now. But those water or energy recapture systems are not viable at the scale that we use uh, in this area. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out that I think was important, and Tom and I are on the same page, when I was speaking of treating uh, the sewer water to potable water standards, uses the same reverse osmosis technology as desalinization requires 20% of the energy to do it. So that's the opportunity that we'd like to see the state move towards is helping develop the permitting process that allows us to take water we're already using and reuse it. Far, far, far more efficient. And when we're here discussing climate sustainability, the greenhouse issues associated with desalinization are really, really significant. And so the opportunity to reuse and cut your energy by 80% is, is a significant opportunity. So that's a little uh, state on uh, reverse osmosis and desalinization in San Juan County. osmosis process would remove those from the water. In other walks of life, we're told to live on our income and not our capital. 
is there a way of reconfiguring water use so that we're not depleting our, you know, water storage in the ground, uh, the, the aquifers? And is that a, a is that a measurable goal? And is that a laudable goal? You want that, Vicky? Yeah. Um, so. We, Repeat the question. Right. The the question is whether or not we're depleting the, depleting the resource, and. Um, this, the situation with the aquifers in, in our county, which an island environment is, is really different than aquifers elsewhere, such as Ozmala, for instance, where you have a huge basin of water that's been accumulating water for millions of years, thousands of years. Um, even island county, where there are <clears throat> actually thousands of feet of glacial sediments and deposits, there's, there's very old water um, collected there, fresh water collections. In San Juan County, our water is immediately available. What we have in our aquifers comes down annually and recharge. And actually, there's been some some numbers, although I wouldn't, um, I don't, we haven't act, done a complete study to say this is how, how it goes. That little graphic that I showed of Lopez, where we're looking at water levels, the water is recharging annually to see. We have very shallow aquifers in San Juan County. We don't have deep basins of water. The East Sound is probably one of the few parts of the county where there actually is a basin that's full of water there that can be somewhat measured. Um, so as far as our capital goes, our capital is, is really something that comes and, and goes. It's a resource that's constantly recycling. And that's much simpler, potentially much less expensive, and could be used by a lot more people. Um, it involves taking water from everything except the kitchen sink, basically, um, and the toilets, of course, and directing it with gravity flow to a, um, a, a bed of some sort of growing plants. And um, it goes directly to some surface irrigation. It's not allowed to be above the ground at any point. And um, could be used very simply if you wanted to just use water from something like the washing machine, because you've already got a pump. And then you know, that could be a source of irrigation for your um, growing plants. And it's not required to be used year-round. You can have a little Y thing that allows you to put it all into the septic system when it's not needed or in the summer. You can change that to direct everything except the kitchen sink and the toilets mm -hmm. to this bed of growing vegetation. Or if you want to use it year-round, you can do some sort of greenhouse thing and have the great vegetation grow year-round. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, Maybe San Juan County should consider allowing that kind of gray water reuse also. Okay, and, and I am familiar with that. Um, the State Department of Health uh, did adopt a separate uh, rule for gray water reuse, and that rule was adopted in uh, 2010 or 2011. Uh, however, uh, the specific implementation on that was if uh, local health jurisdictions did not have the resources to implement, we would default back to uh, the general uh, WAC for sewage. So I am familiar with that. I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, this, this was considered, uh, as I understand it, uh, back in, in 2010 at the county level, and it was determined that we would not pursue that. So uh, here we are in uh, 2015. That's, that's something that we might look for if, if that's warranted. So just, just for those of you that um, are interested in that, essentially uh, you must have a permitted on-site sewage treatment system, so a combined system, or be connected to a public sewer system. And there are provisions, um, as you mentioned, they split out gray water into both light and dark, as I think what you were describing. Um, light being uh, the wastewater from uh, bathroom sinks and um, those those gray waters that are 
uh, less contaminated than, say, a kitchen sink. Um, so they, they split it up into different tiers and have uh, different uh, dispersal uh, requirements. So a homeowner would be responsible for operating that during the growing season um, through a valve. Uh, and then uh, during the wet season, I mean, they define the growing season as a uh, period of time between the two frosts, the first frost and the, and the last of the season. And then it must be, the valve must be turned and, and all the wastewater routed through your um, normal on-site sewage system or your, your public sewer connection. So um, again, that, that was discussed at, at the county level uh, back when the rule was adopted. That's not to say that we can't start that discussion. What would we refer to that? Is there a simple title for that? Uh, WAC 246274. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Twelve years ago, the late County Commissioner Alan Licker had a meeting with the County Manager of Nantucket Island. Uh, the idea being that we don't want to be the completely overbuilt and, and super expensive Nantucket Island. We want to preserve something of this island like we have now. And in pursuit of that, uh, he entered into the uh, County list of things to do a water carrying capacity study, which would uh, determine how much more development is possible in the county before we reach uh, uh, the before uh, carrying capacity of, of the water that's available is exceeded, and that has been on the books for 12 years and nothing has been done. So my question for you guys is, uh, why haven't you done it and when are you going to do it? I'll take that one. <laughs> that study's never been funded is why it hasn't been done for one thing. And then I spent a significant piece, a part of my discussion talking about the wide number of variabilities about uh, water use and water demand that would make that extremely difficult. I don't see it uh, a productive pursuit to try to put a specific number on this is how much water that's available and how many people it can support. Partly because there are so many options available for providing water that is demanded. I don't think water resources needs to be monitored and it needs to be followed. It needs to be a discussion or a piece of a growth discussion. But people need water. They will find a way. And East Sound and Friday Harbor have both spent significant resources identifying uh, and desalinization as an option and what's possible that way. Uh, all of our Group B water systems have required by the state uh, the need to evidence that we have the capacity to supply the growth that is being anticipated by the county. And the Department of Ecology has given those waters, the larger water systems, uh, water rights at this point to support the growth that's being projected. So Tom and I disagree with the urgency of that study. It could be done, but Tom, go to your council people and say, not only pretty please that study, but uh, here's the resource, financial resources necessary to do it. In the meantime, development will continue, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, then. Well, I, I, look, I, want, I want to go one more step with that. Um, county code is very specific with arduous standards that require anyone developing be able to prove that they have the water resources available to support their development. And that that proof includes that their use of water will not impair existing users of water. So overbuilding, there are protections in place. Like real sharp. Indeed. Well, even individual wells um, or subdivisions 
have to show the county that there's sufficient water before they can either get a building permit or subdivide the land. Right. And in a subdivision, it's fairly rigorous. You have to do monitoring studies, 20, 48-hour pump tests. You have to basically prove that you can produce enough water for the number of lots that you want to subdivide and that you're not, like Paul said, impairing other wells. They require that you have to monitor wells around the, around the neighborhood to make sure that they're not drawing the water down or that they're pulling salt water into their shoreline property. So um, I think the county has some of the most stringent pump test uh, mm -hmm. requirements in the state. I yep. yeah. Well, and again, you can uh, get, a, get a building permit based on rainwater collection. It's that really what are the limits of uh, the capacity of rainwater collection is as, as the collection starts impacting aquifer recharge possibly. But, uh, that's really a, kind of an intangible right now. Well, I, I can go a step farther than that, Tom. That the Water Resources Committee commissioned a study by the Golder Group, and that study made the assumption that every residence in San Juan County had rainwater catchment to support their domestic needs. And even with every property using it, the impact on aquifer recharge was de minimis. Means it wouldn't, we could still maintain aquifer recharge if we all used rainwater catchment. Uh, I, I, there's something that I'm not getting here. That is, um, this summer, I noticed a new phenomenon. Maybe it's been here for a while, but almost every day I saw the water truck. And it seemed like it was uh, delivering water at a great charge to a lot of people, because I saw it a lot and I'd never seen it before. So clearly people, people's wells are going dry now. And so if, if my well went dry, which of you would I go to, and could I say, can you supply me with water, or maybe could we stop it, the development that you think doesn't need to be stopped, because it's already happening, it seems to me. Yeah, Jim, really the, the key is storage. You know, if you have storage tanks, um, if you have a 20,000 gallon storage tank, it, even if you have a well that is just trickling water, all the time into that storage tank. That's that's really the key. It's just um, storage has a uh, dollar value attached to it. So it's. You know, my it's, question is, the trucks are already here, and people don't have those storage tanks. So when they run out of water, who do they go to? Or do they go to anybody? Or do they sell their place, which is now? Well, I, again, I think a lot of those water trucks are going or filling storage tanks. Um, because people don't have enough storage capacity. And that works for all of you? Well, Does some of those, like that? some of those, the, okay, so what you're talking about is the water trucks, they buy water from the town of Friday Harbor and then they truck it out to people who have, most of them are individual wells, I believe, um, whether they're going dry. So there's a couple of re things that the individual landowner could do. One of them is they could put in more water storage and store more water. That will cost money, but that's the responsibility. They're going to have their own on-site system. They could deepen their well, which provides more in-ground storage of water. Even if the water table is dropping, a lot of times the water trucks will just pour the water into the top of the well to bring it back up again, and then they use it for a month, and it draws it down, they pour more water in. So people have to figure out, if they're landowners, how they're going to get their own water. And I think... You know, there are options for rainwater catchment, ponds, uh, other ways you can get water if you're in an area that the aquifer isn't going to produce enough water. So the first question I'd ask you is, uh, if you're running out of water, what are you doing to monitor your well's capacity? Okay. Okay, okay I didn't do it. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. The, the, Why did the real estate guy sell it to me knowing that uh, this is going to be the future of this county? Uh, I recommend anyone who's buying the property pay to have a well pump test done on that well. You're right, the resource, water resource, has a huge stake in what the property value is. Okay? So you ought to know what it was. 
Uh, that is, but your concern is one of the reasons why we up the standard that you need to evidence with a well of capable of producing before you can get a permit. Yeah, but if all those things are done, why are they running We up the standard, okay? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. One could be because wells do not have an infinite life. Wells require either rehabilitation or, or re-drilling. It's not, I did it once and I'm done with it. Okay? So there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, there, San Juan County is also unique in that we have permitted development on trucked water. You don't have to have a well at all. So some of those trucks can... And they just buy it to, to yes. Why do we do it? Um, that's a policy decision. Yeah, that, that's a council person decision. Yeah. So that's yes. our list of things we're going to keep pushing for. Right. So just to just to echo, if, if I may, uh, a statement that that both uh, Paul and and Peter made as far as uh, water availability for a building permit. Our county code allows rainwater catchment and hauled water as alternative water sources. So clearly. Um, the water availability process is, is not going to uh, prohibit uh, growth. You know, there are, and, and even uh, for drinking water wells, um, wells that produce less than 200 gallons per day, uh, you can uh, file a covenant uh, and get a building permit based on that source as long as that's communicated forward to, to future property owners. So. So this summer, obviously, we had a very dry summer, and one of the main things that the Water Resource Committee was um, doing this summer was tracking drought conditions. Um, these some water users, mainly the impact that was seen early in the spring with the very dry spring is that people started using more water um, during that, you know, we obviously, if we're going to continue to have dry summers like the one we had last year, we have to pay, pay careful attention as our water comes seasonally, we're getting it right now, and we get very little rainfall in the summertime. Um, one thing that happened last summer when we were doing this, watching the drought conditions, is that we were tracking what was happening with all the water and, and found out that not very good records were being kept about what was going on, talking to the folks at the town and the various water haulers. Um, the town was selling, most of the water they were selling this summer was going out to water uh, the, the construction of the Cat Point Road. And when they finally figured out, sorted out that that was what the water haulers were buying water for, they cut off that supply. Um, so um, <laughs> the road department had to find another source of water because they obviously didn't want to be selling potable water for, for dust suppression. So if you saw a lot of water hauling activity this summer, which we were concerned about, um, I think a lot of that actually was for um, industrial use, for construction use, and not for potable water. People's wells run out of water every summer, and hauling water is, has been a historic and traditional um, way of supplementing water sources in the county uh, for a long time. Thinking about climate resilience, though, rather than growth issues, <laughs> Um, trying to figure out how to store more water is, is really, you know, probably one of the best tactics there, there is, as well as cutting down on, on water use, reducing, um, recycling water, using water, um, great water for irrigation and that kind of thing. Is anyone keeping track of the number of wells that go dry in this year and previous years? Um, that would be a goal. That, that information would have to be volunteered um, and as far as you, you know, like keeping a database yes. and that sort of thing. Yeah, I know we're always looking for that information. We've always been looking for that information, but it's really hard because people have to volunteer that information. Hauled water is one way of, of calculating that. But what we found this summer is that in the past we would use hauled water as an indicator of people's wells going dry, but some a lot of it goes to um, to construction use, and, and that had they don't break it out when they sell it. So that's you know that's something that would be good to um, try to you know develop that information base a little bit more. Um, I have a question about uh, saltwater intrusion and if uh, I 
Wells can't be a public person to answer this, but uh, can Wells recover if their if abuse stops? Can they uh, once again become freshwater wells or freshwater flush out the salt water eventually? Mm, yes. You might be able to add to that, but I, it's a it's a wedge basically between the pressure from the fresh water floating on top of the salt water that's coming in from the ocean, and if you draw down that fresh water, the salt water will basically come up and intrude. I would think if you stopped pumping it, that it would flush itself back out. Yes. But there are concerns that some well fields have become contaminated with salt water. And, and since the salt water is more dense, mm -hmm. they would tend to go down into the bottom of the well bore and, you know, sit down. Right. right. Well, it's um, seawater intrusion is a matter of the, the gradient, the pressure between the freshwater and the seawater interface. It's, it, it's not so much like classic contamination where it comes in and then, you know, can stay there for a long time. So um, if um, the freshwater recharges and isn't being drawn down, past that, that point where that interface is, is intruding, then it, you know, it, will, it will flush out, basically. It will become fresh again. And actually, a lot of the wells that are intruded, and you see this on Lopez a lot because we track the water quality there on a regular basis, it fluctuates greatly depending on what the dry season, from the dry season to the wet season. Just before my question, I'd like to mention that the Salinas um, Aquifer in California, one of the bed baskets of the world, is now salinated and lost forever. Um, the question for Peter and uh, perhaps Kyle is, you know, catchment is a low-hanging fruit. It has a whole lot of benefits, including counts against your stormwater mitigation. Uh, that one of the problems is is the is the you know, we got new types of roots, and they're, they're not all metal and, and comp. They're, they're, you know, uh, various kinds of uh, synthetic shingles and so forth. Um, it is, and the, the standard is, it's got to be an, an analyzed metal root or a, a ceramic tile root uh, to catch potable water off of. Uh, it, is there, are there, are there new types of root materials that, have they been studied with reference to safety uh, for, for uh, potable water catchment for domestic use? Um, and um, can we, uh, is, is there a way to keep up with that in Washington law? Well, it's just metal roofs have been uh, kind of so standard that's that that's what most roofs are. And really, there's not the only type of roof that I really won't use with a catching system is a cedar shake roof because of all the tannins. It's just really hard to clean that up. But uh, pretty much any other type of roof you can filter out the contaminants. Um, again, it's, it's, it's really the difference between a catchment system that is just for irrigation and one that's for potable water. Um, so potable water is a lot stricter and really is uh, you know, best to use metal, metal rough. It's just kind of the safest. So the State Department of Health that regulates Group A water systems, the large one, has a standard for uh, rain catchment facilities that are part of those larger systems. And the roofing material needs to meet NFS 61 standards, which is the same for any material in the system to, that is part of potable water stuff. So uh, I don't believe many normal metal roofs have been tested to that standard, but there aren't many large systems that use rain catchment either. They should. I would, I would echo that too. It's, 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 it's very uncommon for people or roofing manufacturers to send their materials to NSF for the testing. So I think uh, as we move forward, that may become more mainstream. So uh, I have a question uh, again about uh, saltwater intrusion. Thank you all so much for informing yourself uh, on this important topic. But in, a, in the big picture, so you're talking about hydrostatic pressure, fresh water differential with salt water, but yet the growth in this community and everything else, so you start uh, taking that volume, which we don't know anything about in our 
so called aquifers and bedrock tracks here on this island. We don't know anything about that volume. So you start drawing that volume down, those cracks extend geologically out into the salt. And so can't you, any of you envision a point where a growth in this island could easily get to the point where in some summer we draw down enough that saltwater intrusion becomes a major topic with future water use here? Sure, absolutely. That's why we have invested a significant amount of money building monitoring networks in the locations where seawater intrusion is most likely to occur. So we have dozens of data loggers in wells in area at high risk of seawater intrusion. Those data loggers are monitoring the water level in that well on an hourly basis throughout the year. And four times a year we go out and we download that information and we take uh, chloride uh, measurements as well and, and we study those. And on Lopez, again, where seawater intrusion is uh, most common, we have then invested in building a uh, groundwater model of that entire area that can project what happens to the seawater interface as we add 10% withdrawal, 20% withdrawal. So it's an ongoing stuff, it's an ongoing monitoring capacity that that will send up the red flags you need to to know before you go too far. And that was part of my recommendation to anybody who's dependent on their own well. That if you're sitting there going, it works now, I'll count on it to keep working, I that's that's kind of rolling the dice. Okay? You should be doing water quality testing on your own well. You should be monitoring for chlorides, and you should be doing depth to water studies, and you should be metering your use. And the reason I say that is because if my neighbor Kimball starts withdrawing a great deal of water and my well goes wrong, it's my burden of proof to demonstrate that Kimball's withdrawal impaired me. And if you don't have depth to water and chloride records and metering records, you can't prove that impairment. So do we call you to get that testing? I mean, that's, that's Jim's, I mean, is this the role of, in your community? information about what labs and what kinds of things to monitor and then it's your burden to go collect the water samples or hire uh, their professional people that can collect that data too, but you, the homeowner can collect it for yeah. themselves. The depth of water is, is takes some equipment and uh, I, you can call Kyle and he can give you a list of the uh, certified uh, satellite management operators in the state. They're also available on the Department of Health website, but one of those folks can do that. And uh, the one I've talked to most recently, it's 85 bucks. But it requires that you turn your well off for a period of time so that your well comes back to stabilization. And it ought to be done at the same time every year. Right, so uh, individual well owners, uh, we don't have an ongoing program at the county level, but we are here for technical assistance. So uh, if you're on an individual well or a shared well, the county is looking at that well at the time of building permit application only. And beyond that, there is no ongoing monitoring besides technical assistance if you, if you phone our office. Um, we certainly can put you in touch with a list of uh, water professionals, as Paul mentioned, satellite management agencies, or even water system designers is a credential that we maintain here. Uh, and we also have readily available the state accredited labs um, for water sample results. So we can we definitely uh, put you in touch with that information and, and help you talk, talk through your concerns. 
I was going to add one more thing about the seawater intrusion. At least in the rural areas of the county, where you have individual septic systems, the water is basically coming out mm -hmm. of the ground and going right back into the ground. And we're hoping it's getting treated and not just you know running out onto the ground. But that's Kyle's responsibility. So, um, <laughs> but there is that's a that's a great recycling system. I mean, if you're taking it out and irrigating a whole bunch of property and then the water's going up in evapotranspiration, that's a whole other deal. But most of us, most of the water that we're taking out of the ground is basically going right back into the ground. On, on that note, may I say that um, just the other day, uh, I had the septic system person come to inspect my septic. And I said, oh, I'm so glad, you know, this is my second notice. I, I somehow lost my first notice. I don't know what happened to it. And so now I got a non-compliance notice. Mm -hmm. So I quickly called the septic person, and they came right out and said, oh, I'm so glad, you know, because I want everybody to be in compliance. He said, that's a joke. Are you kidding? He said, they don't, uh, the city cannot force people to be in compliance. The city can only send them a notice and then send them a second notice. But he said, I know half the island is not in compliance. It can that be true? <laughs> I didn't expect this question. <laughs> oh, come on now. <laughs> uh, there are penalties for non-compliance with septic inspections. Yes. In the uh, county. In the well. She said city. But, well, okay. Um, Any anybody who's on an on-site sewage system is in the county. In the, in the county. Uh, is going to be uh, on our mailing list for septic inspections. So, and when you reference the city, I'm, I'm assuming you reference the county because we're the ones who are sending the letters and enforcing that. Um, there, there are penalties um, outlined in county code. Yes, we do delay that as long as possible because we're not in the business of penalizing folks. We're in the business of providing education and nudging to ensure that the inspections are done. So. We haven't uh, gone down that path so far. We have a short list of folks um, who are on that list, and we're working with them very closely. Uh, but if, if we have to go uh, to the, the penalization and the fine, uh, we will do that. So I just wanted to jump in one quick thing. At the community discussion that we had, one of the outcomes of that um, was that there was a group by that happened on uh, water catchment tanks. And so I, I can see a lot of people were scribbling down this idea of monitoring your system and particularly your uh, quantity uh, uh, that is your meter. So um, maybe there's gonna be another group buying water meters so they can make high on you neighbor. <laughs> No, that, that's, it's about 30%. Okay, 30%. It's a substantial number. Yep. In the building permit process, and Peter probably can address this, is that, uh, are the plans of the homeowner who's building a house, are they, uh, when they submit their application, they do testing of the well and all that kind of stuff, do they, um, do they have to disclose what their landscaping plans are, or, and are those taken into account in terms of uh, permitting the well or determining what the well has to no, it's really not even a consideration. Yeah, it's really not. You just have to uh, show a proof of water availability. But that's based on but the number of bedrooms, not the feet, based on right. the number of square feet. It doesn't of take into account irrigation. Because there's some pretty substantial landscaping mm -hmm. uh, projects and some high end properties mm -hmm. on the county. And I can really? There. Well, thank you, guys. Kyle, you want? I can. I can tell you that through the county water availability process, uh, landscaping is not a consideration. Well, is that a, is that a problem? Well, I, is that a big I would add one thing. I have personal experience with a subdivision in the Falls Bay area where the county actually, in the subdivision prop review process, because there was concerns about water impairment of, of wells, conditioned the subdivision and prohibited the developer from uh, putting hose bibs on the outside of the houses uh, or or in the covenant written into the to the lots basically prohibiting any outdoor irrigation from the, from the well. So 
county has, has conditioned, conditioned has conditioned subdivisions. I don't think it does it routinely, but when the neighbors raise a stink, they do it. So. Yeah, and most um, most places that I know of that have a lot of landscaping have rainwater collection systems, just you know, because you need that much water in August. So it's it's really fine. David, if I could just comment on your, on your question, which is early, it opens up kind of Pandora's box, but uh, landscaping and, and private vegetable gardens and landscapes. So um, home gardeners were the highest percentage of clients uh, that we've had at the WC Extension Office. If you think about farms, there's, there's a 200 and roughly 70 um, farms out there. There are thousands of home gardens. Smaller area per garden, but so many more of them that I can't help but think that there's a significant amount of water coming from home gardens. That is, is totally off the radar of the county and, and the, the homeowner associations and the dormants that are being monitored. Um, and so that could be very significant, but there needs to be some kind of a, a, a survey to find out more about that. So, uh in East Sound, the highest 10% of our residential water users use 30% of the water. So, and a normal use over a quarter, which we bill on, is 10,000 gallons. This summer, I had home a home that used 100,000 gallons in that period. And that goes back, we're going back now to our rate structure and those bills will double or triple. And they were already in the uh, $2,000 range for a quarter. But there are some people who, I don't care. <laughs> you know? So price signal is, is the last measure. And in some cases, even that tripling, it will not be a strong enough price signal. But we do send letters to the top 10% of every billing pe period, letting people know, here's what the norm was, and here's where you were. So we do try to use that peer pressure, because that's where the greatest savings can come from. But a lot of these, where you're saying there's expensive water, I mean, so, uh, from what I'm hearing from some of these water um, or, uh, homeowners groups are that people that do use the RBO, vacation rental by owner, those are the I haven't seen that yet. I'm, I'm, I've made the request of the county GIS folks to, uh, because Rick Hughes had asked them to identify the uh, vacation rental homes. And I have offered to say, I will run the water numbers used by them and compare them to the norm or compare them to the use of that property before it went into that business. I don't know if that's true or not yet, though. But I'm, I'm interested in that topic. My, my question, I'm not sure who it's to, it, first it's a comment, and, and it has to agree with what you just said. There's so much question about the database of information we have. I lived in Iowa 20 years before I moved here three years ago, and I think of people with wells, they like fishermen and gamblers and gold miners, they lie. And they lie about how much water they use, how much production they get out of the well, and they're afraid that they report that the well is bad, it affects the property value if they ever sell. Huge amount of secrecy. Mm -hmm. So that's one comment. And when everyone laughs about we have this whole thing, and then the guy says half are out of compliance, aren't expecting the question. I, is the information we have really enough to decide? And then I have one specific question. I'm sorry, uh, Peter. contractor Peter. Peter. You said that in in certain circumstances you have to prove that you're not impacting your neighbor's wells. No, that came no. up. Oh, the, yeah, Kim said. So no, I think I was that, there, there's a way someone can come onto my property and force me to reveal what my well is doing in order for that person to prove something about their impact on me. So what, what, is, what is that about proving ahead of time, before you can do development, 
that you're not going to impact neighbors uh, with that. Sure. So I think the thing is, okay, so you're you're on this property here with your well, and this guy moves in next door, and suddenly your well starts to drop or go down. Now, as Paul said, if you've been diligently collecting data on how much water you use and measuring your water level and the water quality, and suddenly your water your well drops just because this guy developed this property next to you, you do have a case. You could go to uh, the county or uh, you could take it to the state mm -hmm. and basically sue in court over impairment of your well. If you could establish in court that you have over the history of your well this amount of water and suddenly this guy <coughs> built, this, built this big house and suddenly your well went dry, and the only other person that could have done that was this person, you could basically sue him in court. Did, did I mishear that there was something about before development demonstrating that there is water available without impacting neighbors? No. There isn't any. There's no. Uh, you just have to have a, an exclusion zone from a septic system. What I'll speak to is uh, seawater intrusion risk protocol. And that is, uh, during subdivision, a pump test has to occur and there has to be monitoring wells uh, in the area to determine uh, the sustainability of the aquifer and uh, the conductivity of it. So there is, there is uh, a study that, that determines whether or not, to the best of the ability at that time, uh, ongoing pumping of that proposed water system will not uh, increase the risk of seawater intrusion. That's one example. But that ongoing monitoring of your well is voluntary. You do not have to allow someone else access to your well. 